AFM volunteers are happy to provide this training to you. You are encouraged to share what you learned from this training with your colleagues. This training is provided free of charge and does not include a certificate of attendance at this time. The training will be recorded and when possible, recordings will be available at AFM's YouTube channel for future viewing. Since this is a one hour training, we will start with training and we'll invite you to introduce yourselves using the chat feature in Zoom. At the end of the training, um, we will have tea time and you are invited to stay and network and ask further questions about the training topic or to discuss other pertinent topics to the fire service. Please make sure to mute your microphones and if you have any questions, you may unmute yourself to ask. Now Nancy will get us started with words of encouragement. Thank you, Nancy. Welcome, thank you, Shandy. Good morning, everyone. Um, really excited today about our training with Ed Collette and excited to see some new faces with us uh, for the weekly training, but not new names. So that's a wonderful um, welcome. And uh, today, Jose is um, on leave. And so uh, we'll, I'll be sharing some words of encouragement with you. And today, I just wanted to read just a short passage, um, actually from Psalm. Um, and uh, Psalm 103, and just a, a piece of that. Uh, praise the Lord, O my soul, from his inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and not forget his benefits. Who, forgiving your sins, heals your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. He satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I think about the fire service and the work that you do. And I know many of you have responded um, to uh, pit and latrine uh, rescues. And um, I think about that redemption that's available um, through, through God and his benefits to us and the way that he not only redeems those that uh, we rescue, but he also is there for those that, um, that are the rescuers and rescues you as well. Um, so I just want to encourage you to um, remember the, um, that there is love available to you that can re reduce anxiety, reduce your stress, um, and just to be an encouragement to you today. Um, let's say a short prayer and then we'll get started with training. Lord, we um, are just grateful for every single firefighter that's here today and um, their, their background and their training and just am thankful for uh, the benefits that you give to them and uh, providing for them. Lord. And I just pray that you will be an encouragement today as we provide this training and that we will um, continue to safely respond in the communities where we serve. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, so Ed is going to take over the training today and I'm um, really excited. Uh, a couple weeks ago he came to me and said, can I do something that's not about water? And uh, so if any of you have been to any of Ed's trainings, he is um, our expert in rural water movement and uh, pump operations and Today, he's going to be sharing some different training with us and very excited to provide this topic to you. So, Ed, all yours. Okay, great. Thanks, Nancy. Well, as Nancy said, my what I kind of become known for is the water supply and water movement, but there's a lot more out there that I like. I'm really involved in all of our technical rescue, and you know, this is kind of an aspect of technical rescue that I think is really important. Uh, stabilization and lifting are some basic things that we do on calls quite regularly. Um, and we'll get into talking about this. It's really, I'm, I think it's something really cool. Um, one of the things that got me interested, I'm a mechanical engineer by background. So there's a lot of weights and distributions and forces and moments. So we'll so, show how objects can be stabilized and then moved. Um, so with that, I'll start by sharing my screen. And there we go. Uh, 
it should be shared now. Okay. Got my screen shared there. Okay, so we'll talk about stabilization and lifting. A lot of people will call it lifting and stabilization. I like to look at it before we can even think about lifting any type of object, we need to make sure it's stabilized. And why do we stabilize things? Well, the biggest thing we stabilize for is it prevents movement of the object, which helps the patient and helps us. Because think about it, one of the main things that we work on is a car. If you get into a car, it'll bounce around on the suspension. And if you have an injured victim in there, theirs potentially will aggravate their injuries with the car moving. The other thing we usually do with stabilization is we're going to do some type of action on the car, like extrication, as you can see in the picture, you know, we're using the spreaders to open up, um, open up the dash. If we didn't have stabilization under there, we're using that stabilization to put the force directly to the ground. If we didn't have that, we would just spread against the car itself and we wouldn't get um, the movement that we wanted from the car. So we use stabilization to prevent an object from moving and then so we direct the force directly into the ground that we're applying on the object. So when we're trying to stabilize, the first thing we wanna do is look how the object can move. Now, it can usually move forward, it can move backwards, it can move side to side, up and down. Along with moving in a straight line, it can also rotate. So if something can move left to right, it can also rotate left to right, forward and back. So that rotation, potentially we need to be aware of it as as we lift one end, when we go into the lifting portion, as we lift one end, it actually will make one end go down lower. So we have to be aware where, where we're going to put our lifting and stabilization points. So in this car, you know, this car is really easy to get an idea of how it could move. It's really just going to move slide front to back, left to right, and up to down on the suspension. When you get into other objects that are not so neatly placed, like the one in the previous picture that was setting on a barrier, then looking at how you need to capture the load of the object so it doesn't move is a little more um, thought provoking. It requires a little more thought to make sure we capture all the ways that load can move. Because our objective in stabilization is to lash that object to the ground basically so that it is not going to move while we're working on it. And the only movement involved in that object is be the movement that we make it do. So one of the biggest things we look at is stabilization on cars. It's the most common object that we have to stabilize, you know, mainly because it's a, one of the common one of the common objects we have to lift. People get stuck under them. They get either because they are hit in an accident on the road, or for us, they're working on them and the jack falls down or something falls down on them, the car falls down on them. So that's why the car is really a common one, but we can also have other objects like heavy machinery, um, concrete blocks, concrete um, culverts. Anything can roll and be on top of someone that we need to stabilize or move, or it can just be something we need to stabilize in order to get it removed before we can get like, if we're going through a collapse scenario, we have to stabilize things as we move the debris off, but that's kind of another level of stabilization. So the first thing, the basic element of stabilization we have is cribbing. It's common because it's, for us, it's just made of wood and it's very common and easy for us to get. The normal sizes that we use on our trucks here and it's common throughout the US are, you know, a hundred, we call it by two by fours, four by fours and six by six wood, which would be 50 millimeters by 100 millimeters, 100 by 100 and 150 by 150. Um, it's, it's easy to work with, it's readily available for us. Um, 
And one thing I got to thinking about, if you're in areas where it might not be, you know, I can just run out to the store and buy, you know, 50 meters of four by four lumber without any issue. If you're in places where it's harder to get this type of wood and potential, you know, to use for cribbing for stabilization. One thing that I thought about when I was just on a trip um, I was at a factory that they had brought, they had imported a bunch of material to use during one of their outages. And there was a lot of crating that was made of this four by four lumber in the same type of, pine, you know, softwood pine. It was killed dry because it has to be of a certain grade for import export for that type of crating. So I was thinking that that would be one thing if you're in an area that where there's industry that they may be getting, um, materials coming in from overseas or that they may be shipping that they may have extra wood or discarded wood that you could work with them to say hey can we have some of when you get all this material in for your projects the crating could we look through the crating and see if it'd be any good for us to be able to use on you know for some of our stabilization projects that we have to get our cribbing stock up you know, so work with some of your local manufacturers. If you're in a coastal town where you have, you know, the harbors, talk to the people, the importers and the harbor masters to see, you know, is there a way that when crating comes off of this stuff that's bring, coming in from overseas, is it possible we can evaluate this wood to see if it would meet the needs for our cribbing that we need to carry on our trucks to be able to do lifting and stabilization? So that, that would be one source and if you're in an area where it's not that easy to get material. Uh, the other things you can think about is steel. Steel, it might be more available, but it's heavier. Things to think about, it's heavier. Um, and sometimes the load is a little different as far as it can carry uh, and the failure mechanisms are different. There is a whole bunch of testing that has been done on wooden cribs. Um, and different wooden shoring. So we have a really good idea of what the load capacities are. Uh, what we do with the cribbing, and this is coming up to look at where all our load capacities are and all the testing that's done. You know, normally what we do is we will build a box crib. And as you can see here, let me get my little pointer up. You know. So, and as you can see here, it's a pointer. Like right here, we have a stack. These are our wooden cribs right here. These are called, you know, our crib elements, and every layer is called a tier. These are normally about uh, 22 inches, so roughly maybe 400 millimeters long each piece. The reason they're that long, it's easy to handle. And that is how deep the compartments on our fire engines are. So these fit nicely in our fire engines. So we'll stack these up, as you can see in this picture over here, we'll stack these up in tiers until we can capture a load to be able to stabilize it. Because if you look here, this car had, this is one of our training evolutions, this car had a concrete culvert fall on it as the scenario. So we were able to put a steel bar through it and then we built our cribbing up and we actually have two sizes in this crib. We have our larger six by six and then finish it up with four by fours. This using the larger ones on the bottom allows us to go at a higher height than some of the rule because of the, it's six inches tall compared to four. And there are some rules of thumb that we like to follow when we build these box cribs. One thing to look at, you notice there it's not built all the way out to the edge here. There's this gap, which is roughly the same width as a piece of our lumber. That is done on purpose. So if there was a failure, say we did overload this crib box here, this cribbing would actually crush in on itself and basically lock, lock together. If we had these scooted out all the way to the edges, when that failed, instead of locking together like this, if you were at the edge, one, one of the pieces of lumber would just 
more than likely just roll off the edge and cause the whole box to fail and tumble over. So we always want to have that overlap. The other thing that's important is to make sure, notice that all the intersections line up. So base, what we build here as we make this box crib is a column to support whatever object we're holding. So if you look, these are just columns that go up and we made it in over here. It's the higher you go up, that's why we kind of restrict the height for stability. And it's also harder to keep all those columns lined up the taller you get. You know, if someone shifts it off like four or five millimeters a little bit every time, eventually you can be off the entire width of one of your pieces of lumber. So that's why we try to keep roughly less than one meter on a 100, 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter piece of lumber, we keep it by about three times. We want to keep it around three times the uh, size of the piece of lumber. So some of the rules when we lift up the box crib, this is actually out of the FEMA shoring guide. One of the good references for stabilization that's online is you can get is the US government's federal emergency management. They've worked with the Army Corps of Engineers to produce what's called the fog manual. It's a field operation guide. It has a lot of stabilization, structural collapse, uh, technical rescue stuff that's really geared towards the urban search and rescue teams. So they've done a lot of testing, experimentation to know the capacities of things like the shoring and the cribbing. So as you can see here, like a standard crib box that we would use with 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter can hold you know, 24,000 pounds or roughly 12,000 kilos. If you go up for the larger, you can go up and it'll be about 30 kilo if you use the 150 by 150. Now, a couple things to look at. We wanna make sure these box cribs when we build them they need to be on stable ground. So we want to have it as flat as possible. And we'd like to have a solid tier of cribbing under it. But one of the things we've always found, especially if we start going into lifting evolutions, is you'll get, uh, you'll run out of cribbing. So we'll actually put a piece of plywood, three quarter inch plywood on the base and then build up. What's catching the load is the, is the corners and you wanna make sure you try to get the load on the corners and you want to make it evenly balanced. You don't wanna load up on one corner because if you load one corner, this will become unstable over here, have a tendency to collapse. Um, as you can see here, they wanna to try to load all four. This is a little better when they use two box cribs and captured here, but the, these are still a little unstable. If you were only, so this I would actually tie down with like a ratchet strap to make sure I kept my cribbing bound together and would not come up and come apart. The other thing is these boxes don't have to be square on the load. One thing I would sometimes I will do is I'll set it in at an angle so I capture this corner and this corner on my load and that balances my load around the crib better so it's more stable but it allows me to only have to capture two points on it. But as you'll see, a lot of times when we're doing just simple cars, we end up actually putting more of the load in the middle. A lot of that just has to do with how the car, how we have access to the car and what load points we can grab on a car. So the rule, what we always wanna keep in mind when we're building our box cribs for our stabilization, is we always want to have an overlap so that they're not on the edges. So we want to always come in a little bit from the edges, carry as much as the load close on the corners or as close as the corners as we can, keep the load balanced so we're not overloading one side of the crib compared to the other. We don't want to go higher than one meter, 1.6 1, 1. meters at the max to get that and you know, excuse some of my conversions, I'm not a native 
metric person um, and realize that loading, putting the load in the middle of the lumber will actually reduce the capacity from that. You know, a standard box crib holds 24,000, as we said, 1,200 kilo, 12,000 kilos. It will be less than that if we're loading in the middle. But most of the loads that we're going to be dealing with, especially if we're doing um, stabilizing cars, will be less than that anyhow. Wedges are just a piece of cribbing that we've cut down at an angle. Not every gap we need to fill is, you know, 100 millimeters or 50 millimeters. Sometimes it's smaller. So we'll use this wedge here to slide in between our box crib and our object until we can put another full piece of cribbing in. So like as, I, as when we talk about lifting, we'll lift and just be sliding. We'll slide in and slide in and slide in until we get to the top here. And then we can pull quickly pull the wedge out and put a full piece of cribbing in there. We can also use it to fill gaps on the ground if we're stabilizing. Like this, we're stabilizing a bus on its side. So to help it from rolling this way, we've taken and we've put wedges in there to fill the gaps between the ground and the bus side. So, and the one thing that some people forget is you'll notice I put a short piece of cribbing here so I'm able to slide the wedge on it. Some people will actually start and put the wedge right here. Well, a couple things will happen. One, it'll put more of a load on this corner, whereas if I have it across here, it's got load here, but it also has some of the load on this corner as well. But what will happen is that wedge won't go flat across. And by the time you come get to this side, it won't be able just to slide up on top of this piece of box crib. So you always want to make sure you're sliding your wedges across a solid piece of cribbing. So you don't have the problem. And I've seen people actually knock out the far piece of cribbing when they're trying to just put the wedge this way because it'll just knock that out because the tip of the wedge is actually down here by the time it gets to the other side. So that's why it always slides across. Here's just a quick video about some other things we can do with cribbing other than make a box crib. This is, I went through with my department and we did a quick way of quick vehicle stabilization using box cribbing. I mean, just using our cribbing elements. Let's see if I can get it to play. There we go. And what and we'll cover what a step chalk is short in the next section. Hey Ed, we don't have great sound, so if you want to. Okay, is it not? Does it not share the audio from that? Is it just bleeding over from? I think so. I think it's just bleeding over from your computer. Is there? So does it not? Okay. Well. There's a way to do it. Um, if you unshare and reshare with sharing computer audio. Okay. Um, it, that we probably should have checked that. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know that. So that's let's... okay. I forget it frequently. <laughs> okay. Sorry, guys. Well, here, here, I'll go through some things what the video is saying. Instead of using what well, we'll see how the big step chocks can get in the way, they're also kind of tall. What we're able to do is just use a single piece of cribbing here and catch a solid point on the car. That's one thing a lot of people will forget about is they'll just like go to a fender, you know, just a piece of easily removed body work. So we want to make sure we're something solid on there. And then we can just use a single to go back here. 
So we're looking for that structure. And let's move around here and get to the next one. My cursor left me. There we go. So, yeah, sorry that the audio didn't work on that, but basically the whole thing comes down to you can use, you don't have to use the whole to build a box crib. You can just slide a couple pieces of cribbing underneath. But remember, you only want to go make one, maybe two pieces of cribbing just setting on their own high because it's unstable this way. You know, it'll hold load here, but if someone comes by, it's easy to kick that to one side or the other. So it's not stable side to side. These are what, when I was talking about step chocks, these are what we use for fast stabilization on a vehicle. Um, we have some that we made on our own, just using pieces of wood that we screwed together. Notice we have platforms at different heights. So these slide under the corners of the car um, to make it stable. These are ones that were commercially purchased that are plastic that will do the same thing. The problem with that I don't like about these, they're very big. So if I have a car that the tires are flat or there's damage to it, so it's sitting lower to the ground, I'm only going to have like maybe one of the first two steps that are actually needed to engage the car to get the car to contact the ground. And then I have this large section of step chalk out my way. As you can see out here, this one sticks out two, two blocks. And it was a little bit in the way when we were taking the door off here as we were moving the door out, it's potential to catch here and kick it out of the way. The other thing to remember with any stabilization, especially if you're using it for extrication, hopefully you want to make sure this is all the way off the suspension on a car so that you know it's solidly going from the car to the cribbing or the step chocks to the ground. If the suspension is still engaged, as you take parts of the car off and it gets lighter, you'll actually come up off the cribbing. So you wanna make sure the suspension is fully disengaged from the ground and you've got these step chocks or your cribbing in deep enough. So these things, you know, step chocks, cribbing, box cribs, works great if something is regularly shaped and it's setting flat on the ground. Sometimes we know cars will flip on their sides or it's just kind of, they're in a difficult position to use something like a box crib or a step chalk. So when we're on, on the side, we basically have what we call a strut system that we use to stabilize the object, be it a vehicle or in this case, we have a cement mixer we were training with. So we use this strut. So the strut comes up here, captures the load here. So it's pushing against pushing against the load to try to keep it up. But remember, everything forces are equal and opposite. So when this is pushing up against, this is pushing up against the load, the load is actually pushing against the strut. So to keep the strut from kicking out, we take this uh, ratchet strap, this strapping here, and go to another section of the vehicle. It has to be the same object. So another par lower part of the same object to be able to stabilize it to keep the bottom from kicking out due to the force up here. One thing when you're looking, if you do set up struts, is to make sure the webbing that goes from the base of your strut to the object is as low as possible. As you can see here, we're a little high, but not too high. This is probably the highest I would wanna go on this scenario. If you go too high, what'll happen is you'll actually start to pull that base up off of the ground and you'll lose the support from the ground. Now, you know, this is, we have them, but you don't need a good commercial grade strut system if you have to stabilize something on its side. 
Basically, if you can build a triangle and connect it back to the load, you can have a strut stabilization. And this is something I set up at the station yesterday just to demonstrate how you do that. Just with a simple two by four, you can go ahead and use a ratchet strap and tie around the base of the four by four and pull it back to the object. Another thing you could do if you don't have a ratchet strap to pull it back to the object is if you're in just dirt, you can dig out a hole to set this in so that the backside of the hole would actually be the support of the object. But in that case, you wanna make sure it's pretty solid hard ground so that your support member here won't push into the ground. So we're talking hard clay soil, soft sand soil, it wouldn't work as well. And the load would shift, we still need to then somehow tie it back. You could even use rope, you wouldn't need to use a ratchet strap. You could tie back with a rope to go from the base of here to your object. We can also drive in spike stakes behind this if we have good soil to be able to, um, to be able to support it. And some things we want to look for when we're setting these up is we usually want a nice angle. We don't want lower than a 45 degree angle. We want to be higher up on the car. So we make sure we're trying to be higher than there's the vehicles or the object center of mass. We don't necessarily have to even go to the vehicle itself. As you can see in this vehicle here, we actually connected the two struts to themselves. So we're pulling these struts together and they're pushing up to capture the load of the vehicle. So when the vehicle pushes down, it's trying to spread the struts apart, but the, since the spread, struts are tied together, they're not going to let the vehicle drop. Some things to look at for placement. The reason we did this, instead of using, we could have used a box crib to crib up to these corners, that would have taken a lot of time. It also would have put a lot of um, in stuff in the way. So we couldn't have, our, ob our objective was to go in through this back window to simulate a victim rescue. If we had box cribs in here on each corner, um, one, we don't carry enough cribbing on our truck to be able to do that. And two, it would have been in the way. So we just quickly set up our struts that gave plenty of room to be able to get in here. So you wanna, this is set up, this strut here's in a bad position if we would want to go and open this door, but we extricate, we were going to extricate the driver through the passenger side. So this was actually set up based on, we knew what our tactics were. So you always kind of need, when you're setting up any stabilization for either lifting or extrication, know what type of tactics you're going to be using so you don't put your stabilization in the way. Cause it's like a lot of, things in the fire service, they're big, they're heavy and not easily moved. Once you set something down, you don't wanna to have to redo it because it'll really take some time. Another option to do to help stabilize is tie it. See this car right here, it's saying on top of this barrier, we took, quick took a strap and we wrapped it around the barrier and we ratchet tied the car to the barrier. So now it's gonna help not slide side to side um, I've been on accidents where we needed to move the car, but to stabilize the car, we took and we connected it, we tied it to a tree, a large tree. We knew the tree wasn't going to move, so we tied it to the tree, and that was our stabilization. It's things to think about, use what's around you. If the car or the object's against something, you know, a building, a column, something you're confident is not going to move, you can tie it to that. So we talked about lifting. I mean, we talked about stabilization. So we have our object stabilized. The next thing we need to know is what are we going to do to lift it off of our victim? So if we have a victim under the car, the car's stabilized, the only way it's going to move is in a direction or in a manner that we tell the object to move. Some of the tools. The simplest tool we have for lifting is a lever. 
You know, one of the ancients, Archimedes, said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum to place it uh, or place it instead of pale it, and I shall move the world. Because the farther you get, if you have a fulcrum and you put a lever under the load, if you make this long enough, your force is multiplied by the length of this lever. So you can actually pick up the, a heavier load with using less force. So there's two ways you can do it. You can put your pivot point or fulcrum between the load and your force. This would be you pushing down on it. Or you can put it on the far end of the load and then you pick up on it. This the this one, the top one, the class one lever is actually is the easiest type of lever as far as the what you can use as far as your force you need. Things you can use, pry bars. Uh, heavy, you know, if you have a beam in a, in a construction area, uh, the lumber that we use for, if you have longer pieces of the lumber to use for cribbing. Um, um, I've, I've had issues, I, I've been taught a method that you can use a ladder. Now, our chiefs don't may not like using the ladders to do it, but if it means saving someone's life, you know, I'll use a ladder, pick a car off someone, and then we'll talk about damaging the equipment later. Um, but things you can use, but then things you can use for a fulcrum, um, a couple a couple rolls of hose, stack a couple hose, rolls of hose on top of each other, and then put your beam across it or put your pry bar on it. Uh, wheel, ch uh, wheel chocks for your fire engines. Take one of the wheel chocks and then put Put your lever, whatever you're going to use for your lever, on your wheel chalk to pry up. Some simple things. Think outside the box. Go around your truck and figure out what could I use for a lever? What could I use for a fulcrum to put that lever on? You know, kind of, you know, start training and pre-planning. What can I use? Think outside the box on how you can use some of your equipment, but just make sure you're using it safely and within kind of the load specifications of it. Uh, wedges are, you know, we talked about we talked about wedges to take up space in our cribbing and to help us stabilize it. We can also use it quickly to do a small raise if we only need one or two uh, inches to bring it up, like maybe 50 millimeters. If you take the two wedges when they're married together like that and drive them together as the wedges work up on themselves, they'll pick up the load. So you can do relatively light to medium loads, a very short distance using two wedges pounded together. The only disadvantage to this is you, you have to be able to be, have access to both sides of the loads to push the wedges together. So it's another quick way, but there are some limitations with this method. Floor jacks, I wasn't able to get a picture of one. It's something most garages have, like mechanic shop. Mechanics use floor jacks all the time. Um, they've got four wheels on it, hydraulic jack. You pull the handle down, pick it up. Um, several of the trainings I've been to, one, one of the trainers that's an excellent in mechanic rescue, he's like, they use floor jacks more often than they use airbags. We love to use airbags because if we have this tool, that's a really cool tool, but the a number of times throughout your a country that airbags are used is very few compared to thousands of people use floor jacks every day. It's a very quick, very easy way to lift something up. One thing I like about them is you don't have to reset. You have a very high lift capacity with a floor jack without having to reset. Other things are bottle jacks. We carry bottle jacks on our trucks. Again, you can get more lift than you can with an airbag. The disadvantage of a bottle jack is you cannot put it if you have a very small gap. As you can see, we label, we label these so we have the capacity. So these are 220 tons. And these are to almost 11 inches high. So we need an 11 inch gap between the load and the ground to be able to put this jack in place. But once in place, 
we know it will go all the way up to 18 and a half inches. So that's another thing with anything that you have for lifting, you want to have it labeled so everyone knows capacity, how big of a gap you need to insert this lifting tool, and then also how high you can lift once you start. Another thing that we can use is our spreaders. This takes training. If you're going to use the spreaders to pick up an object, the first time you do this should not be with a victim underneath a car or an object. This is something that it's unstable to do it. You still need to crib and have something to capture the load. But once you practice with this and get good at it, it is a very quick and effective way. One thing we'll see if, I'll get the video to run here. Maybe. Okay, there's no sound. So one thing you see the angle here, when before you start to lift, you need to make sure the tips of the spreaders are flat on the ground. A lot of people actually take and instead of making sure the tips are flat on the ground, they'll have the arm flat on the ground. If the arm is flat on the ground, the, the spreader will tend to rotate up until it finds where the tips are flat, and then it's not where you want it to be on your object you're lifting. So the key to using the spreader is making sure the tips are flat on the ground, you have a solid point that you can capture when it swings up on the object. Now, also what this will do, it's not a straight up lift. So like our jacks, our airbags, they push straight up. With a spreader, the jaws open up like this. So as you're lifting, it's also going to be pushing the load slightly forward. So that's another thing you have to take into consideration is there's basically two directions this will move using the spreader. This is a setup and that I did that I lifted a car with a spreader. Um, we had to get this car off an object. We put in a solid base, so that's what these two pieces of cribbing were here. Then I just used the spreader to spread it up. We put in a step chalk and some more cribbing to capture the load for once we were done, and then let it down. That's really key when you're doing with this, using the spreaders to lift it up, is to have cribbing to be able to capture the load once you're done. It's very easy, if you have spreaders and you start to try this, you'll notice it's very easy for the spreaders to roll one way or the other. So finally, probably the most complex thing we have to lift is the airbag. You know, it's difficult to set up. Um, there's many moving parts to it. You know, there's various capacity. The nice thing is they're usually only about 25 millimeters thick so that when you slide it in, it doesn't take a very large gap to get it into to start lifting. The disadvantage is the load capacity is only good for 25 millimeters. And then you can see, see how this bag starts, we call it turning into a basketball. So instead of being nice and flat, the corners start to round. So when you have two of these bags together with rounded corners, they become unstable and you can wobble. So we only try to lift maybe at most um, 200 millimeters with these bags. And then we have to stop. We have cribbing here, deflate the bags, our cribbing, our stabilization holds the load. We build more cribbing up to raise the bags up, and then we can lift again. So if you have a high distance that you need to lift, it takes a while to do with airbags. As you can see, this is a special airbag that's actually two airbags that have been designed that they're basically glued together. And we're lifting up a bus with it. And th this, this system here is actually really nice since it is two bags fused together. 
it is more stable than stacking two regular airbags together. And this gives us, I think, almost a meter of lift. But you can also see, notice how the bus is starting to crease right here. Now we'll talk about when we want to lift, making sure that you lift on solid parts of the object. So one thing about the capacity of an airbag that you always want to look up, you know, every airbag is labeled with the capacity, the operating pressure. That's critical to make sure you know the correct operating pressure. Some bags are um, 100, 145 PSI, some are 120. Um, if you put the wrong pressure in, you either won't get as much capacity as the rating or you'll damage the bags by overinflating. As we can see, you know, we showed that that kind of turns into a basketball. The higher it goes, it starts to round off and the area at the top gets smaller. We lose, we lose load capacity the higher we go because the amount of load that we can carry is determined by the surface area we have in contact with the object. So if you have a bag at a certain rating, it's assuming you've covered the entire face of the airbag. So if you have an object you're lifting that only covers a portion of that face, you won't uh, be able to reach the maximum capacity of the airbag because it doesn't have the area covering the bag. So you don't have the pressure of the air acting on the total surface of the object you're trying to lift. That's why we always try to grab use airbags that are higher capacity than we know we'll need to use. And when, you, when you're doing it, you want to try to have full contact. If it's on a crib, your crib, your box crib has to be solid underneath it. Since they do pillow out, if you would have it just a regular box crib with the four points, if you set your airbag on that, eventually that airbag would just blow the box crib out. They're complicated to set up. You know, you have your controllers, your air bottles, your air lines. As you can see here, you can see how this load we're lifting, see how this is pillowed up. We, this is actually now, even though this is a 16 ton bag rated, we're down to being able to lift about eight tons with it or support eight tons due to the fact we lost our surface area. But as you can see, this is actually fairly unstable as we lose our base of support as this inflates out. Now, some of the newer airbags actually have capture devices internally, so you can only inflate them so far, and that helps to keep them stable. One thing when we're operating, one per, only one person operates, one person will command that person to operate. So the operator of the airbag doesn't just start you know, picking up the airbag when he wants. It's one person is in command, so he's watching everything around. He's looking at the victim, he's looking at, you know, the load, if anything shifts, and he's telling the person operating the airbag, and as you can see on the airbags, this has a blue, blue air hose, this has a black air hose. Always two different color air hoses on the bags because the person commanding the lift will say up on, in this case, up on blue. And then the operator will push the button to release, push air into the blue. Then the person in command will say up on black. So then the operator will be able to open, you know, open the valve to put air into the black hose bag. So that's always critical to have two, because if you had two different colors, as you can see here, We'll be lifting here, but we're going to be all the way over here. We want to stay out. As you can see how these round, there's a potential they become unstable. And I, I've read case studies on it where they'll kick out. There have actually been fatalities from of firefighters where the airbags have kicked out under the load. So this is pretty much you take the back corner of the airbag and go out roughly a 45 degree angle. And that should be an exclusion zone where no one is at during the lift. 
So you want everyone out of this zone while they're doing the lift in case something kicks out. So that's why you know it's important to have one person in charge and the, you only lift when that person tells the lift to happen. So speaking of lifts, let's talk about some more lifting operations. You know, planning it is kind of the key to it. First thing you're going to do is figure out the weight of the object. It's important. You don't want to, if you put, grab an airbag that's too small, it won't lift the object. If you grab one that's way too big, it may not fit in the space you need. So you need to look at, to plan, okay, what the weight am I going to use? Um, and how big a bag do I need to fit in the area? You know, just some quick ways to estimate. For large trucks, at least, we use an estimation of about 10,000 kilograms per axle. So this truck right here would roughly be 30,000 kilograms, just a rough guess. Um, cars, they can be anywhere from two to 4,000 kilograms. You know, that's something we can easily lift with most of our airbags. I think our normal airbags we start out at is roughly mm, 4,000 kilograms is the smallest one we use. But also one thing to think about, whenever you're lifting an object, you're not lifting the entire weight. So if I want to lift the front of this car to get someone that's pinned on, out from under it, I'm only lifting the weight of the front of the car. I'm not lifting any of the weight in the back of the car. I'm pivoting the front up and around the back axle. So that's another thing to consider. If you already have a safety factor built in by estimating the total weight of the load because you know you're not going, you're only going to be lifting a portion of that. So whenever we're lifting, we're not, unless we're doing a dual lift, we're always going to be lifting so around a pivot point. So we'll pick up one end and the other end will go down. So like in this case, if we look at this car, if we pick up the back, the front, it'll rotate around the front tire. If we pick up kind of in front behind the middle by a ways before we're at the center of the car, it will still rotate around the front of the tire, the front axle. If we rotate, if we pick up just behind the front axle, it'll rotate around the rear axle. And the same if we pick up in the front, it'll rotate around the rear axle. Now this is important to, to look at based on where your victim's going to be. So if my victim's here, we wanna try to make sure, you know, the pivot point, if we lift, we wanna lift here, the pivot points here. So we wanna get between this pivot point and the victim. So that means we're gonna lift up the shortest amount possible to free the victim. Um, one thing, and we do it at trainings all the time. You know, we spread a dash and extrication and we make it, you know, a meet, we push it up a meter off of the seat. You know, same thing when we do lifts, we do huge lifts. We only need to lift enough to get the victim out. If we only need to lift 50 millimeters, we only lift 50 millimeters. So as you can see with this, by being in between this pivot point where the load will pivot around, we're able to free the victim in the smallest amount of space as we can. And we also capture, this would be our crib or our strut system. We also capture back behind so that if this fails, it still holds up. Always have something before you do any lift, always have the load stabilized and a method to capture it. If it falls, if something fails and it falls, you're probably going to kill the victim. They may be alive until you start picking it up, but if you drop it on them again, it's probably going to almost end in fatal injuries. One thing we always say, as you lift, you bring that state, that load capture, that stabilization up to the object. So if you lift it up, we say lift an inch, crib an inch. Um, so if you lift 25 millimeters, you have to crib up to it 25 millimeters or bring your stabilization up to it. So that stabilization has 
always in contact with the object. And that can be, you know, struts, cribbing, step chalks, anything that you're moving to grab that load to minimize the distance that if there is a failure, that it will not fall back on the victim. That is probably one of the, I hope if you take anything away from this class is you have to have stabilization in place to make sure you don't drop the load on the victim again if there's a failure. So as you can see, a lot of it's dependent. Here, you need to know where about the center of, center of the object you're lifting is. So here, like in our others thing, we have our force that we're using to lift and we have our capture back here. So if this fails, oops, that didn't work how I wanted it to. So if this fails here, this will go away. And, but if we look here at this scenario where we crib, we're like, okay, it's easy. We'll just throw cribbing right here for our load capture. Well, it's actually on the opposite side of the center of the object. So what'll happen if this fails here, this will actually drop back down on the victim. I was looking to try to get my clicker back because these actually this will when this falls down this rotates this way instead of being held up. So make sure you're on the same side of the center of the object as you are the victim when you're stabilizing. So your lift, lift, victim, stabilization, all on the same side of the center. So you don't drop it. Even though you have stabilization, if it's on the wrong side of the center of mass, it'll drop it back down on the victim. Lift placement, we want to make sure, again, we talked about this is what that lift looked like on the bus. See how it crushed up? So it lifted, but we wasted probably 100 millimeters of 100 millimeters of space on that lift that that caved in. So that was wasted work. We need to make sure we're always like with our airbags up perpendicular to our object we're lifting. As you can see here, they, we use some wedges to bring that flat up against it. So lift placement, placement in the lift, placement of your capture stabilization. So you get into, lifts can be very simple, you know, a quick one is if you had a jack and a step chalk, you have three people to be able to do that. You put the jack under the car or the object, put a step chalk in next to it as you jack up, you push that step chalk in as your load capture, and then you have a third person to be able to slide the victim out as soon as the object's high enough. Um, very complex operations, something like this where we're lifting a cement mixer off of a car. You can see this is our capture. We're using a strut to follow our airbags. This actually has a locking collar, so it qualifies as our um, positive capture device. So you have two people just on the stabilization on this side, two people on the stabilization on the other side, one person calling the lift in command, one person operating the airbags. So you're already up to six people to do this lift. And this is a very complex lift. It takes a lot of time. Um, so as you can see, it can go from very simple to very complex. And like anything in the fire service, the more you train and the more you plan, the easier the, these events will go. So did pretty good. I went a little over on time, but you know, if we're good, any questions, um, any questions for any of this? So, uh, I'm asking, how can you lift uh, a load? Uh, for instance, a vehicle. When doing uh, extrication, while, uh, while the casualty is inside the vehicle. Hey. It kind of, it, it was kind of hard to hear that. Uh, it, it wasn't how you can, 
Could you say that one more time? How can you lift a vehicle while the casualty is inside? Oh, well, are you, not, are you not going to add more injuries? Well, and that, that's why we do everything. If we have someone, and somehow I turned off subtitles, so. Um, that's why if we're lifting the, if we're lifting an object off of the vehicle, we would, um, we would, that's why we have all of the capture devices here. So if there was someone in this vehicle and we needed to lift the vehicle, as you can see, we're lifting it, but we also have the ability that if there is a failure, these struts will capture the load and make sure the load does not return to the vehicle. Now, say it's an accident, and I can see where you'd be saying here, say there's an accident and someone's under the vehicle and there's someone in the vehicle. What we're probably going to do is we'll have to have a medical assessment of who the more critical patient is. More than likely, the more critical patient will be under the vehicle. And what we'll do is we'll do our standard medical protocol, like C-spine stabilization on the victim that's inside the vehicle, as we set up to actually do our lifting and depending upon how long it takes to lift, we may make the decision that while, if we have the manpower, while we're setting up to lift to get the patient out from under the vehicle, that we would actually be able to start the extrication and get the patient out of the vehicle. So a lot of it's just going to be depending upon manpower, timing, and what our resources are. But the big thing is if we have to lift while someone's in the vehicle, mm -hmm. it's going to be putting all of our manual C-spine stabilization um, on that person. Because if we have time to put, you know, a KED board and all the other stabilization on it, we have time to get them out of the car before we lift it. I hope that answered your question. Thank you so much, Ed, and thank you to all of you for participating in today's training. We will be posting the recording online soon for future reference. We would ask that you complete our online evaluation so that we can continue to improve our trainings. We are working hard on next, week, next week's training, and you will be able to use the same link to log on to the training next week if you're able to attend. Please invite other firefighters to register and attend our trainings. Thank you, and remember, a better fire service starts with you.